Thank you for joining us. This is Legend of the Drowned Isles. The legends, it's plural, because we're going to do all kinds of legendary things. Uh, this is a homebrew 5th Ed D&D campaign, uh, of which we uh, every week gather together to solve problems and create more. Uh, and also uh, swear at technical issues. So if you're watching this, either live on Twitch on Sunday eve uh, well, afternoon, I should say, at 3 o'clock Atlantic time, or on youtube.com slash ENCAF1 in the Legends of the Drowned Dials or Legends or, or the Great Confusion, L-O-T-D-I, the Great Confusion playlist. If you're watching us, you might be thinking, hey, did you guys not have an episode last week? Wasn't there some something that was happening Yes, yes, there was, and things happened. Uh, some technical issues, unfortunately, uh, with my machine caused um, different problems. <laughs> in fact, caused, I think, in total, about three different problems all to collide at once. Uh, we were able to stream for the first part, but apparently uh, my audio was completely left out, which is not good because I was doing all kinds of expositional uh, presentation and daydreams or night dreams and all kinds of things. And, well, I guess something rebelled. I think the computer itself rebelled because it froze, which then meant it crashed because uh, it had to be manually rebooted. After that, my sound was back, but most of what we had was already uh, corrupted. So no video was released last week. And uh, clearly, uh, no Twitch viewers were <laughs> tuned in last week to warn us of that. But that's okay. Um, we do this for fun. We do this for practice. We do this for an exercise. We do this um, for the future, where one day we can look back on this and laugh. I'm already laughing at last week, but that's mostly because I want to cry off my hardware and laughing so much more exercise. So, who am I? I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. I am the host and GM and apparently the owner of of sketchy hardware. Uh, I will hopefully replace that hardware in the new year. I don't know why I said in the new year, just because it seems like an appropriate time to uh, throw hardware to the curb. But thankfully, I'm rescued from being the only person here by my players, uh, starting on my left with Pat. My name is Pat. I am playing Silas Marsh, uh, local cultist, uh, and I don't own any of the hardware. <laughs> I do like the uh, constantly changing title. It seems to be appropriate. Hi, I'm Marie, and I'm playing Annie, who is a human rogue. And also sometimes known as Marie the Dice Dragon, and I understand you have some new dice for the season. He's, he's the, the ice cream dice uh, candy cane ones that they released last year. So that seems mm -hmm. like a dangerous thing, because what if you actually think they could taste like candy canes? Chomp, 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 chomp. Uh, yes, wonder, that, that is very valid concern. I wonder if you could mix peppermint extract in with the dice molds and have them smell like peppermint. That probably would exacerbate that problem. I, I don't think the resin would cure properly, but there are scented dice. Mm -hmm. what? Yeah, you can do it with some stuff, but not if it's water-based. Okay, well, we'll have to find an oil-based peppermint extract and try this. Uh, and also, we're joined by Nax. Yes, we are. Hey, I'm Nax, and I'm the owner of brand new hardware because I got a new webcam. So Metric Today is coming to you in HD. So you can see like all the wrinkles and faults on my face, unfortunately. Uh, damn it. <laughs> anyway, I'm playing Medric Half-Orc Cleric. And, also and I also got a drawing Nick. tablet. I did my Christmas shopping early. Nice. So soon <laughs> you might also see like character drawings of poor quality. <laughs> <laughs> I do miss the, uh, the table illustrations you used to do when we were gathered together. Yeah. I have several stickies yeah. with some pencil illustrations on them. Uh, and also the owner of a headset, which is kind of neat. Hey, it's not you, though. Well, it doesn't count. It's, 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 it's new to you, or new to this moment, yeah. at the very least. Yeah, and uh, it should also be noted, I'm not on my crappy old 11-year-old laptop, so the annoying chirp, I don't know if everybody could hear it, is not happening today. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very appreciated. <laughs> it turned out that... Um, to a, a small aside, the, the audio that was captured last time was the audio from everyone else. Because my audio was not captured, it was also not reducing everybody else's audio, so it was a constant chirping. It was all that was recorded for most of the time when I wasn't talking. <sighs> Isn't technology fun? 
All right, we'll move away from the technological woes to the woes of a different kind. If a woes is spelled another way, is it still just as sweet as its other woes? I don't know. Getting goofy. That's a good start. Let us begin with a little bit of recap, a little longer perhaps on some of the details just because uh, there was no uh, recorded episode last week. By the way, um, while I haven't updated most of my hardware, I have an audio recorder that's looped into the system now, so at least that, at least that'll be recorded. Last time, still recovering from the battle in the old temple, the group split off on the road outside of Elthwater. Silas took his cousin Mira and her husband Luther back to the family village, where Odiga proclaimed the wonders of Mother Hydra in selecting Mira to be the dream reader and Silas as the harbinger. Annie and Medric retired to the Three Bells. Medric spent some time contemplating the eternal mysteries of the flame, while Annie spent some time writing up her notes. Sleep came to them all, but so did strange dreams. Annie felt Annie found herself bought on a shabbat. Let me try that sentence again. <laughs> I got I got like two sentences all squished together there. Annie found herself on a ship, bobbing on a busy sea. Rumors seemed to be spreading among the crew, and she could see them whispering to each other. Suspicion seemed rampant. The spotter in the crow's nest cried out, and all eyes turned toward a gray rock on the horizon. Annie spoke to the captain, who told her that it's an island, but they must not go there. He seemed nervous and stalked away to his cabin. A deep fog rolled in, hiding first just the water, then even the other end of the ship, until finally nothing more could be seen than Annie's face, hand in front of her face. Shadows moved in the mist, crew members, presumably, and then blankness. She awoke, as did apparently all the other crew and passengers on board, after being asleep for quite some time. How long? It was impossible to tell. Medric also found himself on board a ship, but this was a fighting vessel, and he was surrounded by soldiers. The feeling in the air is tense excitement, anticipation of the battle ahead. This battle was going to be important, the most important battle. They had been fighting for a while, but this was to be the end of it all. A cry went up on the ship, and everyone went to the deck. The ship rocked with large, angry waves. Strange, shadowy shapes surged out of the water near them. A strong wave threw up the front of the ship, followed by the back of the ship. It continued to tilt forward, throwing the poor soul in the crow's nest far and wide off into the water. Finally, the ship tumbled end over end, spilling all of the crew and soldiers into the water. Medric went under but soon discovered, as many of the others did, that the water was not deep here. It was a beach, and the cry went up from all the fighters. War was in motion again. Silas dreamed that he woke in a chilly cave, holding in his arms what seemed to be at first a baby, but later was revealed to be an enormous snake. He walked to the cave's mouth and saw below him a long beach, he knew that his people were there, packing up everything to leave quick, quickly, gathering in boats to leave the island. Already, farther up the shore, large boats were landing and disgorging troops. Soon, he was on a boat with the others. On the shore, the remains of their village was burning, fires set by them in spite. The person in front of him turned around, and it was his lost wife, Molly Wyndham. She grabbed him by the arms and looked directly into his eyes, a serious and sad look. She spoke to him urgently. I am lost, but not gone. I can hold. When the time is right, I will send help to you to find me, but not any sooner. I will wait for you. The next day, after briefly discussing these dreams, the group decided to make their way out to talk to the Gynosphinx Oracle, Cathron. To save time, they decided to go on horseback. Silas had his horse, Blondie. They rented a horse from Medric, a Pelusi named Jack, and Annie called in that favor with Captain Verendel. He purchased her a well-tempered Lamino, which she named Butterscotch. They rode for a few hours, passing at some distance by the Winthrop farm and finally heading into the woods towards the Lost Temple. It took some time to make their way through the woods, but they found the temple, but strangely, it looked even more aged than when they had been there before. Within, they followed the path of the strange room that unlocked the underground passage and finally stood before Cathron. 
They asked her many questions, which she seemed to struggle to find her own way to answer. She said there were many things that she was forbidden to speak of, specifically anything relating to the very thing she was tasked with eliminating from the world. Catherine confirmed that there were several forces fighting for the town of Ailthwater, and not all of them were unknown to each other. Most, if not all, saw the leaking of great power in the area and wished to claim it for themselves. Catherine also suggested that some assistance might come from a new friend, one who seemed to be at the crossroads of at least three of these concerns, although they might not be aware of it, one Dr. Marigold. Following the discussion, they emerged from the temple, but discovered that it was already night. Riding their horses back into town, they resolved that they would investigate the perpetual storm around Elthwater. And I'll add, eventually, you don't have to be doing that specifically right now, but that was one of the stated intentions when we started up last time, or ended up last time. That said, we're going to assume that you ride back into town unless there's something specific that you need to get done that night. It is late, so I would imagine you might want to um, sleep and get a better rest for the next day, but that's entirely up to you. What would you like to do? What time of day is it when we get back? By the time you make it back to Elthfodder, it will be um, dead of night, so 10 or 11 o'clock at night. It's a lot later than you expected. Certainly not as late as you had ex had expected coming out of uh, the temple, because you left relatively early in the morning. And we're probably all soaked because the storm has probably not ended. It it once you enter the the range of the storm, it certainly is still in full full fury. Although not, uh, there is some lightning and some uh, some flash, some rumbles of thunder. <laughs> The rain isn't particularly heavy at the moment, but there is a little bit and a little bit of wind stirring things around. Enough that the ride back would get you wet. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we probably should meet back here in the morning. Yeah. yeah uh, do you remember that rotating thing that Jonas or Jonas had in the lighthouse? If he could mass produce those, he'd make a fortune. Just like hate drying drying my clothes. <laughs> yes. I think you might have to mass produce the flame of Ignis, though. Yeah, that too. That would have been easier before the attack on the temple. Um I have some thoughts about the storm. Um oh. we might want uh, in the morning we might want to head down to the lighthouse. Because they're going to have, uh, they have a map of the bay. I can probably use it to triangulate it there. Triangulate what? Is that like a spell or something? Sorry. I, I think I've seen that used in, on the ships that I've been on. It, yes. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't get much call to use it uh, as life on ship did not agree with me but i'm actually a trained navigator uh, i can probably find us that spot uh, if it's in the center of the storm uh, and i was thinking if we go into the bay to find it we might want to borrow their pearls of breathing in case we find more people like we did right. last time um, but the other thing is um, we might, uh, uh, Annie, you might want to contact the captain and see if he is willing to send you and us to go do this, because if we can succeed, that may help him, uh, yeah. with his reputation or whatnot. And I think... I think in order uh, in order to rebuild Medric's temple, we're going to need to meet with some of the royals, and that may, if we can get rid of this storm, that may give us an in with that. So it may help several of our problems at once if we handle this right. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah about right. definitely could. Okay, well, then I will see you in the morning, and he'll leave them at the end and continue trudging uh, in the direction of the village for another hour. Good night. Try not to drown. It's a little bit faster on board your horse uh, than it is uh, walking, but it's still a pretty pretty decent trudge. Um, yeah. By now, the... I'm the, assuming uh, I'm just going to return the horse tomorrow. Right. Um, yeah, well, I have it for two weeks. I remember now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You rented it for a while. Cool. And they can stable it um, in, uh, in both of your horses, uh, Annie and Medric. They can stable them at the Three Bells. They have a small stable to the side of the inn. Cool. All right. Um, when you return back to the village, Silas, uh, it's pretty quiet. Um, it's an early rising kind of place. There's not a lot of people up late. Um, yeah. Uh, are you going to go retrieve your son or let him sleep where he is right now? Because he'd be actually probably be at your house, but it would be. Um... He, he's probably at his parents' place next door. Okay. Um, uh, he'd probably just stop in to like for a minute to see if his parents are awake and just say hi. Uh, if they're not, he'd just head back to his house. He, he's not going to disturb them in the middle of the night. Yeah, it looks like there's no lights on uh, burning in there in the house there. So probably everyone's yep. going to sleep. They're used to you having your own time away quite considerably. All right. Next day, the storm has changed somewhat, this time bringing with it heavy fog. Um, only the very distant rumble of thunder, no lightning to, to split the fog, and no rain as such, but the fog is thick enough that it's making it difficult for people to get around. Um, as uh, both of you come awake, Annie and Medrick, um, you wake to the sound of a crash on the street outside and looking out, you can't really make out much detail, but the sounds of shouting uh, describe for you the scene of a cart that ran into someone uh, and then proceeded to run into a second cart because they couldn't really see each other through the fog. Uh, you can just make out the dim lights of different lanterns that are hanging off of those uh, carts, but from where you are, they're nothing more than dim, distant, not even orange lights, muted out to almost a... Uh, a simple little uh, white speck. Like this is like right outside the inn. Yeah, on the basically on the on the road on the back part where your rooms are. Um, I'll run out to see if everyone's okay. All right. Um, yeah, Sam. As you get outside, it's again the fog is so thick it's difficult to kind of make your way through it. Um, both of you make a perception check as you kind of wander through the streets. I would grab my hooded lantern and have my hand on the wall. Okay. I'll give you advantage on the pers on the perception wow. then. Not twenty. Nice. Uh, what what check is this? Perception. Perception. Eighteen for perception. Nice. Uh, Medric, maybe uh, you can or rather uh, Annie can see uh, Medric's eyes glowing ever so slightly, the flame of Ignis burning strongly in him this morning, as both of you make your way fairly confidently through and find, indeed, two wagons that have collided with each other. Um, one of the wagons uh, seems to be in relatively good shape, um, but the other one uh, essentially uh, has had one of its large wheels peeled right off, and there seems to be an argument between the uh, rather old-looking uh, man who's standing and pointing at the broken cart and the very uh, uh, surprised-looking young man who's in the other cart trying to apologize, but also trying to uh, urge his horse to continue to move away. Is everyone okay here? The old man kind of spins and looks in your direction, the voice being probably carrying farther than... The, the view, but your your lantern helping him to at least pinpoint the direction to shout at, as he proceeds to to shout, uh, and I'm not going to shout just because it would get carried over two microphones here. But uh, on my headphones. Well, yeah, um, I don't think I could shout as far as your house, uh, Nax. But 
<laughs> but basically uh, unloads on you about uh, how the uh, how can he be all right? Uh, this wagon is his only way of of getting things to the dock, and there's supposed to be a ship coming in today, and he's if he misses the ship, he'll not get anything out for another month, and so forth. Can I try to grab a hold of the guy who's trying to leave? Like, grab a hold of the reins of his horse? You certainly can try. You can see that he's looking at this as an opportunity to try to stir the reins, so uh, make a, uh, let's see, Sounds like an a, a, an athletics or an acrobatics check. That'll describe how you're doing let's it. Do, let's do acrobatics to try to like. Okay, hop up. Hoop myself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is a sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah, you 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 easily kind of hop up to the side. There's a little step on the side of the wagon, uh, and you put one foot up on that and grab a hold of the reins. The the young man. Um, looks at you kind of shocked, <laughs> kind of really didn't even register you coming out of the fog, uh, and then kind of looks at you, let me go, I didn't do anything wrong, I couldn't see him. He came out of the fog, just like you. You still have to be careful. I've got to get to the you dock. You need to go slow. What because if you were if you were going slowly, it wouldn't your the other cart wouldn't be that damaged. And he looks over at the the, the cart, and kind of squints a little bit, because even from where he's sitting, it's hard to see. And the other the older gentleman just sort of ho hollers up, "Well, I'm I'm sorry, Mister. I just I didn't want to spend too much time in this fog, and I I really couldn't see you there." I'll look at the damage to the wheel. Is it easily fixed? Do you know much about fixing wagons? I've ridden in wagons. I know that the wheel's supposed to be on the side. <laughs> like, is it broken or just like off? Um, make a let's call this an investigation check. Unless you have oh an appropriate <laughs> skill that'd be more more. Uh, uh... Huh? <laughs> With a minus one, that's a sixteen. <laughs> okay. I mean, you kind of you kind of look around and, and, and feel around. The, the wheel itself seems to be intact. Um, it's just that the way that the other wheel seemed to have caught it, or the edge of the wagon maybe caught it, that it pulled the wheel off of the axle. So maybe this could be repaired somehow easily. It doesn't look like anything's splintered or broken. Okay, so that's good. So, uh, hey, everybody, um, if I lift this wagon, can you guys put the wheel back on? Um, the the old talking guy. to oh, okay. talking Can to Annie, the guy in the other wagon, and the old guy. The the old. It's guy. literally the thing we can do. All right, I'll, I'll see what I can do. The kid climbs off. The old man's kind of like, really? You, you can do that? All right, I'll get the tools. A uh, tools. <laughs> Words, Words, they are as a good. <laughs> uh, and All right. the uh, the old man grabs uh, some rope and uh, a, uh, a hammer, and it looks like a chisel, perhaps, and starts to directing you to, like, all right, I need you to hold it up long enough so I can get this part underneath it. Then I'm going to have to be able to lash it together, and he explains a whole series of things about wagon fixing, which I personally do not know. Okay. But it seems like he so has some idea thing, how to fix make it. Make sure the axle is high enough for the wheel to slide back in and then let go. Okay. And the, uh, I mean, the, let go once it's stabilized. The other kid who's hopped off of the wagon kind of moves over, does a double take kind of standing beside you just because he didn't really notice you in the fog. And he does look at you a little strangely, and you realize he's looking up at your face and then kind of trying to look away, and then every once in a while glancing up, and you're figuring... Oh, oh, right. The light of Ignis is with me. And you do ah. realize that you glow a little bit in the darkness as it is. All right. All right. So he will count as assisting you. He's not that strong, but it's still going to count as assisting you. So this is pure athletics. Unless you've got some other way of augmenting this or any spells or whatsoever. Yeah, I forget. <laughs> 
I might have a spell, but I forget exactly how it works. Would if I cast Guidance on... What? To do it out of advantage? He will have advantage because he's being assisted, yes. All right. Uh, guidance would be something you can do, actually. Okay, this, I will cast the, the, the Guidance cantrip on myself. What does that look like? So, Metrop like, kind of like whispers to himself in the fire or effect like flares a little bit and then settles back down, but stronger than before. Okay. Just let me double check guidance. I believe it gives you a D4 on a skill check. Yeah. Yep. And then didn't, didn't the guy hit someone as well before hitting the car? You haven't seen them. <laughs> But you do you do right. kind of see someone lying on the other side of the cart. Are you gonna look for them? Yeah. Okay. You go around the other right. side and you can see that they were kind of hit as a secondary of the, the cart that got smashed into. And they're kind of sitting down, mm -hmm. grabbing their head. Looks like a an, an older woman. Um you can see there's a, a bundle of, of uh or a I should say kind of a scattered pile of little packages all around her. I'll, I'll help her clean up and stuff, like collect everything and help her out. Okay. Um, looks like she was carrying a basket full of turnips. And most of them are kind of soggy and covered in mud right now, but... Oh. Um, they can be washed. <laughs> um, the, the, the basket must have taken most of the actual hit because it's got a big dent in it, but it seems to be still relatively stable. Um, she is holding her head, though. All right. Oh, so. like make sure that she's stable and stuff, yeah. Okay, do a medicine check. Mm. That is a seven. A seven? I mean, she's holding her yeah. head, but, you know, the, with the, the massive mud that kind of mixed into her hair when her head went back, it's hard to really tell anything. Um, you're kind of up close to her, and, and she she makes this face, uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, squints her eyes at you. Thank you, dear. Thank. You. Do I know you? Oh. I've I've been around town a lot. You look familiar. Do I recognize? Not particularly. No. No. You look familiar possibility i look like a lot of people no dear you don't look oh. like anybody but yourself uh i'll have my friend take a look at your head before before you head out oh it's full of rocks don't worry too much oh. <laughs> meanwhile medrick muscles up to the back of the wagon Hurrah! Let's go for the the. Uh, this is an extended task, so we'll need more than one. Okay, this is a time. At advantage. Okay, and that's yeah. a lot better. <laughs> and did you add your D four? Not yet. Uh, D four. Which will apply to the first roll, but it won't apply to the rest of them. Okay. All right. So total of twenty four. That's a pretty good start. So between you and this uh, this young man, you kind of muscle up the uh, the wagon, lift it up. Up out of the mud, it gets a little bit stuck because the, the ground is still kind of perpetually muddy. Even though it hasn't rained, there's never been an opportunity for this town in the in recent weeks to really dry off all that much. But you heave it upward, and you can hear the young man sit, sort of standing beside you, straining. Uh, and the old the old guy's like, all right, good, good. And he straightens up the wheel. All right, just got to hold it there for a little while longer. And you can see him kind of wrapping some rope in. Second roll, you do not have guidance. You still have advantage because of the guy standing beside you. But you can see he's starting to strain. Whew. Luckily for advantage. That's a total of 23. I think you're muted there, uh, uh, Nax. Sorry, there was a dog. <coughs> the first one was a good one, so that's okay. That's, that's very good. So you're managing to hold it up. Uh, the, the old guy's wrapped the rope around. It looks like he's trying to sort of secure it on. Um, as he puts it uh, a little bit closer, you, you kind of see that there, there's nothing is particularly broke, but there's some definitely bent metal that he can't really get back into place. All right, just a little bit longer. 
I, I'm sorry. I, I can't hold it any longer. The young man beside you uh, slumps down. Do your he's best. no longer able to help this you. It's your fault. You know, he's no longer able to help you. He's just not strong enough. Uh, so this one's all on you with no guidance. No. As the man starts to uh, to hammer at the wheel, at the metal parts around the wheel uh, with the, the tool he's brought out, the hammer. 16. Yeah, 16. All right, 16. <laughs> Uh, it's getting to be really, really heavy, and you're Hurry holding up. on, and you're trying, and it's still holding on. I'm doing the best I can. The old man's hammering away at something or other. All right, let it down gently. One more test, this time to let it down gently. Gently. Ish. Ish is probably the right description here. As you, you uh, let go of it, and it kind of slips at the last minute. It's got wheels, and the wheels kind of roll in the mud just from the angle that's on it a little bit, and the heavy weight that's sort of on the, the, the front part of the cart, and it kind of splashes down in the mud. You see the wheel kind of bow out a little bit, but hold. Ha! Damn, that did it. <sighs> well, uh, that's going to have to be repaired. A little better in the near future, but hopefully you can make it down to the docks. If I can get this shipment out, I'll get enough money to finally give this wagon a 1-4. Good. Well, just be careful. Thanks, mister. Yeah, look, no I, problem. I'm really sorry about it. I just, I couldn't, I gotta go. And he kind of hops back up on the wagon, the young man. Well, could. thanks for your help. Thanks, mister. Remember this next time you, hurt, you, you break someone else's property. Hopefully there won't be a next time, he calls behind him as he as he spurs the horse into pretty speedy motion still. Um, and slow down. And your voice is kind of lost. Do we, do we hear a crash? <laughs> no, nothing yet. Anyway, uh, and even the the horse's hooves are uh, are gone in the distance, uh, just from the fog swallowing up those as well. Um, thank you very much, young man. Young woman. Oh, hey. Hey, Milda. Are you all right? And extends his hand to the old woman. I'd be much better if you didn't drive so terribly. It wasn't my fault. They start to bicker in a friendly sort of way. Um, the old man, uh, who does introduce himself as Laszlo, uh, offers Milda a lift. Um, she's going mostly in the same direction, but... He's, uh, he's generous enough to... I'll make a detour. Don't you worry, old woman. Don't you call me an old woman, you old man. Oh, I Sorry, didn't see you there. <laughs> it's time for the cats to make uh, but, I, but I feel like getting Edric's attention to, to her because she seems to be still a little bit disoriented. A little bit in pain. A little bit. Medrick, you're going to take you... a closer look? Yeah. Yeah, I'll let her know. It's like, hey, I'm a cleric of Ignis. Do you mind if I make sure you're okay? Our eyes go kind of wide. Ignis? Oh, did you, you know the flame keeper? better at making sure people aren't hurt than me. Did you know the flame keeper, young man? I did. Terrible shame. She was nice. Mm hmm. She was. And she took several of them with her before she passed on. Well, I, I, I guess that's nice. My uh, my condolences to you, though. She was Thank always you. always good, and for, for when I I broke my arm last year, she was really nice to me. She will be missed. Uh, do you mind if I have a look at you right now? I'm all yours. And she kind of turns and kind of leans back. Almost practically in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, medicine check. What's your name, son? My name is Medrick. Nice to meet you. I'm Milda. Nice to meet you as well. Do you like turnips? And that's a fifth. What was that? Do you like turnips? If I like herbs? Turnips. Yeah. Turnips. Uh, it's not necessary. Yeah, I do, but I mean... uh. My food arrangements are already taken care of. And as uh, you kind of check her over, bruised, hey, need... shaken up a bit, mm -hmm. but not really hurt in any substantial way. Okay. Hey, Annie, do you like turnips? 
Or do you know if Silas likes turnips? I don't know if I've ever had turnips. They just from a no, I would have had them in, in soups and stuff. I mean, they're yeah, they're good in soups and stuff. And she reaches inside her basket and pulls out two turnips, handing one to each of you. There, I haven't got much, but it's something. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Now, Laszlo, you old fool, see. shove over. She starts to climb on the <laughs> wagon. Um, Annie, make a make an intuition check. Or insight? insight. Insight check, thank you. Uh, well, that's a 19 on the dice. Uh, dirty 20. Dirty 20? It suddenly occurs to you that there's no way she could have been hit by this wagon. But she was very keen to get a lift with Laszlo. <laughs> Doll. <laughs> um, as they recede quickly into the fog, the two of you are left there. Presumably to go back in and clean up a little bit and wait for Silas. Uh, I didn't count on getting a workout this early in the morning. Extra bacon it is. All right. Well, you go back inside, clean up a little bit. There's the, the usual morning gatherers there. It's hard to tell day from night just because of the way the fog uh, has rolled in. But judging by the room full, it's probably still pretty early. It's time for the uh, not the earliest of fisher people to come in and get their meal before heading out on the on the boats, but probably anyone who might be a dock worker or who might be trying to prepare caravans. That's the crew that's here now, uh, and word presumably seems to have spread about uh, the the fresh made bread that's made here every day. Um, you're not sure how the word keeps getting out, but people do constantly mention. Uh, I don't want to bring up her name here, but um, uh, Sydney's uh, bread making. Uh, and it seems like there's calls for it uh, and lots come out. Um, there's also uh, plenty of extra bacon at this particular time. Uh, just happens to be a, uh, you know, the, the kind of weather that the pigs are happy for. Well, until they get made into bacon. <laughs> um, I'll give my turn up to one of the sisters and say here it was i don't cook and it was given to me probably sandy she's the one who's out front most of the time sydney's back in the back and saffron is, is uh not up yet she's the brewer mm -hmm. uh, but sandy kind of looks at it smells it well it's a good turnip but it's the strangest tip i've gonna get all day <laughs> i got one too do you want it I also don't cook, and I'm assuming just eating it like an apple would be wasting Not it. I mean, in a pinch, it'll do, but you better be pretty damn well pinched. I'll see what uh, Sydney can do with these. Thank you. She kind of winks and takes them away. Silas, are you doing anything before heading out towards the town that morning? Um, no, he just had breakfast with his family and. Okay. Um, Nikki is quiet, but he is usually fairly quiet anyway. A um, little bit uh, distracted maybe by uh, hair which has grown too long. And you realize that he really needs a haircut. Um, and you kind of realize that you, you didn't notice that because maybe you've been away a little longer and there's maybe a pang of guilt um, from having been rather busy recently. And Nikki's growing up so quickly. Uh, but your mother and father seem content enough to uh, to keep him where the, when they can. That your father will be back out on a boat, I think tonight, or today, I should say. I see him every day, pretty much. <laughs> um, no, I'll make sure that uh, that he eats and uh, tell them that uh, I'll be gone today hopefully we're 
We're going to see if we can fix the storm problem. I'll be back after that. And your your father kind of looks at at you. You're going to fix the storm problem? Is that even possible? We think it's some sort of device that Oxia was using that's <laughs> keeping the storm here. I'm going to try and find it and disable it. Do something about it. Who was Oxia? That was the the sea devil lady that attacked the town. They're apparently coming to take her away. Mm. Um, and he looks somewhat concerned. I have heard about these sea devils, not to be tarried with. Don't want to invite too much trouble. The town can deal with this on its own, can it? Not with the storm. You don't know what it's like there. Imagine if you didn't know if it was day or night, constant rain, caravans not getting in, ships not getting in. It's pretty terrible there. Well, that's what life without the blessing of the mother is, I suppose. Still, don't borrow too much trouble, son. Or, or do I have to start calling you uh, uh, Harbinger? Seems like that's your title these days. I'm just Silas. Well, still, take care of yourself. You too, old man. It's funny, because, of course, he's 40 by the reckoning, but in fantasy world, mm -hmm. he's like ancient. He's like 4,000 years old. And to a 20-year-old, he's ancient. God, 40 years old. Why does he not just, like, fall over and die already? He's too old. All right. <laughs> Uh, so after that delightful, uh, uh, moment at home, um, Nikki kisses you goodbye and just sort of immediately turns off to find some wooden thing to play with. Um, yeah, I'll watch him for a minute and then, uh, and say my goodbyes and head out. Okay. You notice he's taking some, some wooden building blocks and kind of putting them in a mound and then sort of trying to curve the mound a little bit and then he has one of his little uh, wooden people that kind of comes out of the mound and kind of does the sort of mocking walking along um, and you catch him just sort of say someday this will all be yours as he kind of shows the little thing to something else you're not really sure what he's showing it to but it seems to be the expanse out in front of this mound Yes, someday it will all be yours, Nikki. And I ruffle his hair. He kind of squirrels, uh, squirms underneath your hand. Stop it! I'm old now. I point over to his grandfather. No, that's old. Keep it up. You're young. Keep it up. Don't you have to go stop a storm or something? Some of us got to go work. And with that, he puts on his <laughs> coat, heads outside to the boats. Yeah, Silas will head on his way. Are you taking your horse, or are you going to walk? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he always takes his horse into town. but uh... you, you sense the sort of hesitation as you turn your horse towards town. Um, it's almost a, a, a shiver of, of, uh, of, uh, of annoyed anticipation, uh, and it probably has something to do with that distinct line that you, you still cross when you come into town. This time, the boundary not as as uh, sharply defined by rain, but instead uh, uh, the, the uh, broad expanse of fog that seems to rob all the world of shape. And you vanish into it pretty quickly. The road's not too hard to follow on its own, and it's something you've done hundreds of times already. But you imagine that anybody who didn't know this road might find themselves sliding off one side or the other. Nothing terribly dangerous right here, just, just mud and rocks, but um, it's definitely not a, a good sight. Yep. I'm going to do something about this. 
You make your way towards the uh, three bells. You can see there are a few guards that are out carrying lanterns on on long poles, uh, trying to uh, trying to extend their vision a little bit by having the light out there. It doesn't really help that much, but at least it's uh, perhaps going to help others. As you see these strange lights that seem to float in midair, and then the pole resolves, and then you see the the guard holding holding on to it. The three bells is busy as it ever is clearing out a little bit as that first morning well second morning crowd has come out you tie up your horse and inside you find Annie and Medrick Medrick in front of probably the third plate of bacon oh yeah a nice a fresh uh, <laughs> loaf of bread sitting beside you as well half eaten Annie has a carrot I'm just kidding <laughs> Uh, fuck Wait you, Silas. How are you guys doing? Not too bad. There was a bit of action here this morning. Really? An attack? No, an accident. Uh Yeah, there's a lot of people fog out there. Drive, people trying to drive too fast in the fog. They'll do that. Hopefully. At least one of them out. will. Uh, he looks over at Annie and says, well, what are we up to? So the plan was, I go talk to Verandell about having him send us to the lighthouse to try to figure out, to triangulate where the thing is. Uh, yeah, the... I, th I think that'd be a good idea. I mean, maybe help him out a bit, get him uh, wanting to help us in the future or something. I mean, the town needs yeah. someone out doing stuff. So Yeah, it'll help everybody if we can end the storm. And the town needs a temple, so. So after discussing your plans for a while, what would you like to do? Get my stuff on, go see Arendelle, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Silas will go with him, but he'll kind of stick in the background. The... Uh... The uh, windmill, which is also the guard station, former windmill. Um, I think I'm 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 probably going to fall into the habit of Ilfvater is not entirely unlike many people who've lived in Fredericton for a long time, where everything is defined as the building it used to be. Uh, <laughs> so calling it the windmill. The building that used to be yeah, the building formerly known as the windmill, um, is not far away. It's an easy walk even despite the, the sort of thick mud, which now is, is sort of, it's not drying out, but because it's not getting a constant heavy moisture, it's getting that sort of thick consistency, uh, making it kind of gloopy to step through rather than uh, squishy to step, th step through. I really do need to go and find a whole lot of synonyms for, for squishy and gloopy and and, uh, and slimy, just to, to describe this town. But sure. Slurpy. Uh Verandel is there, um, starting off his day essentially by hearing the reports of people from the last night. Um, there's a couple of, of people in front of uh, in front of you, Annie, when you go up to the the door. Um, they're kind of at just stepping inside the doorway, and you can hear them giving their report. Um, there were some um, some fights that they had to break up. Um, there was one case of an accused thief. But the thief was never, never, uh, never caught. Um, there were uh, strange sightings reported a couple of times, but by the time they got there, there was nothing to be seen. Um, and Verandel kind of, kind of nods uh, as if nothing of this is terribly unfamiliar to him or terribly new. 
does uh, see you standing in the doorway, Annie, and waves you in to kind of come in and, and stand and, and wait for your turn, but at least get you out of, the, out of well, what would normally be the rain, but the fog. Medrick, are you going in, uh, Silas, are you going in with uh, Annie, or are you going to stay outside? I'll go in to get out of the rain. Um, I'll try my best to like uh, shake most of the mud off my boots before walking in, though. <laughs> okay. Silas will hang outside for a minute uh, and uh, use press to digitate to just warm up the uh, chest plate of the guards, uh, and then uh, nod his head to them and uh, head on in. You know, they all hear you uh, mutter a little bit, and then as their their chest plates start to warm up, they they look rather alarmed and confused, uh, and look over at you, and then. You hear Verandell say, it's fine. You'll be fine. He's, he's being nice. Well, he says, it, it won't last long, but perhaps this will help. Get I'll mind. whisper to Silas once we're out of earshot. It's like, hey, hey, Silas, um, you should try that on Riemann one time at some point. See what he does. He hates magic. I'm not trying to be mean with this. <laughs> oh, well, the reaction... Well, two things could happen. One, he could find out that, hey, not all magic is bad. And two, it might be funny. Uh, we should probably head in. <laughs> I thought we were all, I, I'm saying this when we're already in. Yeah, you guys are yeah. like out of earshot. Kind of whispering over in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you notice Verando kind of looking over at the whispering, but not saying anything. It's kind of like... You know, they're, they're at least being quiet enough that I don't have to throw them in the, j the jail, which is only a few feet away from them. Um, but Verandell does kind of quickly dismiss the men, uh, thanks them for their work, and tells them both, um, go get a good meal and have a good rest and start again tomorrow. And they kind of nod and head back out into the rain, pull their or in the, in the fog, rather. Uh, Medrick, you would have noticed just by the door as you were scraping your boots off, there's actually a, a piece of wood which has been nailed up in just the right position that uh, it, for cleaning off your boots. You get the feeling that, uh, that because of the mud being so thick and so common, they've kind of established a routine almost and have started to get used to this idea uh, of having just the right spot to, uh, to clear off your boots before going in. Maybe people had been yelling about mud being tracked in numerous times. You're not really sure of the exact implication there, but it's something. I will wipe my boots off on that log. There you go. And you get inside, and uh, Verandell um, gestures to you, uh, Annie. Uh, anything to report? I hope your your horse ride went well. It it did. We got a lot of information that'll be helpful. Um, Part of that was that the storm is probably being caused by something in the town. Something in the town? Someone or something? Probably something. If it was someone, it might be hard to maintain, but something. So we were going to go and try to figure out where the center of the storm is by going to the lighthouse and figured we'd let you know so that you knew what, what was going on, and... He looks a little bit puzzled. Yeah. Uh, how does going to the lighthouse help, help you with what's happening in town? The storm isn't reaching that far, as far as I know. Because from there we can see where the center of... We, we can figure out where the center of the storm is. Get a perspective that you can't from in here, is that it? Basically. All right. Well, I don't have official papers that say that you're working for me just yet, but uh, I think we can we can overlook that for the moment. If you're willing to ride out there, I'm still going to need you to take a shift here and here and there. Um, and my men are, are working all night now. There's been an uptake in small break-ins, things like that, and so we need more people patrolling at night. I think people are getting a little bit um, desperate. That is fair. That's why we want to find what's causing this as quickly as we can. Well, if you can do that, I definitely would appreciate it. Uh, is there anything else I can do, do for you? 
contacted. He said that he should be here soon. That'd be nice. Um, when he does come here, um, will he be making himself known? I don't know. That's up to him. Okay. Uh, just be aware that if he has to sign off on this, uh, if anybody checks the papers, then, well, he might have to actually appear. That is fair. Not that I think it's going to be necessary, but there are some people who are more nosy than they know what to do with. Anyway. I mean, you and, what's his name, uh, Freeman were there when he said who he was, at the very least. Yep. And there shouldn't be too many reasons that Riemann would want to make Gaetano's other name well known, but I wouldn't put it past him. Still, I don't want to borrow trouble from the future. I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, so all three of you are going then? That's the plan. We are. It's well, easier we... to take care of each other. We're close by. <laughs> It's probably a good idea. There haven't been any more incidents on the road, so far as I know, not since the storm started, which is both... Not uh, that we've sorry? Not that we've seen either. Yeah, I think that's both a blessing and a curse. It means, I think, that the bandits aren't preying on the roads anymore because there aren't as many caravans. There was one that came in the other day, had no complaints whatsoever. But... I think they've moved into the town itself. I think that's where most of our extra crime is coming from. Thankfully, nobody seems to have been murdered. It hasn't been that sort of a severe crime, but... I don't know. More fights. More people are scared. This storm... If you can get rid of it, it'll make a major change around here. It'll make my life a lot easier. That's fair. Well, that's what we're trying to do. If there's nothing else you need from me, then why are you standing around here? Get going. The sooner this is gone, the sooner we're all going to be breathing a lot easier. Until next me. time. Oh, and are you going to be back this evening or tomorrow? Um, I'd say safer to say for sure tomorrow. All right. I was just wondering if... You know, if you didn't actually have a patrol set up for that evening, I'm, I've got a couple of evenings free, and I was wondering if you wanted to go for um, another meal or something to, to talk over how things are going and, and maybe give me some perspective. Yeah, well, once I get back. Great, good. Um, I look forward to it. Good luck to all of you. Thanks. And I head up. All right. Back to the three bells. <laughs> oh, someday simultaneous sound will be a thing. Um, <laughs> uh, as you go back, presumably, to the three bells, collect your horses and head out, is there anything else you'd like to do in the town before you do? No. Just maybe poke fun at Annie for, like, the date with her and Del. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sadly, we'll have to do that when uh, when her player's back in control. Yeah, <laughs> when, when the cat is in control of her character. Yeah. Okay, there she is. <laughs> and he's currently a cardboard cutter. <laughs> Making soup, and my cat was about to attack my soup. Oh, Can that's I... unacceptable. Cat versus yeah. soup is not a battle that anybody should see. That's just that's scary because uh, nobody wins. Uh, All right, do you head out on your horses? Uh, heading down along the uh, the lower road, down along the shore, which leads to the uh, lighthouse. Uh, after leaving the fog of the town, you can clearly see the lighthouse up ahead. Uh, not as bright as the first time you'd seen it, but there is that considerable effort, and you get the feeling that maybe 
they've been working on it uh, a little bit more. And uh, what's his name? Jonas has been working harder to try to improve the the brightness and the the uh, the strength of the of the lamp. Um, as he uh, as you approach, um, Tide is uh, is out at the moment, which is good. You can approach on foot, but recall that the lighthouse itself gets flooded when the tide goes in. So you end up tying your horses uh, to the familiar trees on the shore uh, uh, back uh, a ways. Yeah. And make your way in. Um, even before you've made it all the way to the the docks, uh, Henry kind of pops his head out the door uh, and uh, waves enthusiastically. You're back. It's been so long. Hi. Hey, Henry. Uh, and Esther hey. comes out behind her, behind her brother, and kind of puts his arm, her arm around him. Oh, trying to look nonchalant, but you can get the feeling that she's just as excited as Henry is to see you. But trying to be the cool teenager that's like, I'm, I'm super excited Teenage. to see you, <sighs> and you know that sort of that sort of feeling. Um, they greet you there and uh, welcome you in. Um, it's very warm inside. Uh, there's a, a large fire burning, um, basically cooking the meal for later on. Uh, Angus is not there, but uh, Harriet and uh, Jonas is up in the tower. Harriet is there doing the cooking at the moment. Angus is out um, actually fishing <laughs> to find some more, uh, f more uh, food. Um, apparently... While the storm has been bad for anyone anywhere right near the town, for them it hasn't been really touching them at all. And so the weather, while turning into a cooler fall, uh, isn't really uh, uh, a detriment. Um, after a little while, uh, Harriet calls up to, or actually takes up uh, uh, a, uh, a plate of food upstairs to Jonas. Um, but when she comes back down, Jonas is on her heels, uh, eager to see the rest of you. Um, you see that he's kind of, the, the, the clothing that he's wearing is kind of blackened with soot and you can see there's little, little pock marks, uh, where probably, uh, something burning hit his, uh, hit his shirt. He's got a heavy leather apron on as well. that's sort of covered in, in uh, small little burns. Um, but he's rather eager to see all of you. Uh, hello. Um, uh, Jonas, uh, do you mind if we borrow some of your charts? The charts? Uh, yeah. Uh, come on up uh, to the uh, tower. Like, uh, not, not, not to take them, but just to use them for a minute. Yeah, everything's set up on the table upstairs. Um, I was just trying to, to determine exactly how far the beam was reaching uh, based on some, certain reflections. Uh, I've put a couple of small mirrors in certain places just to be able to measure distances and make sure it's actually happening. But I'm finding that the floats that I'm putting out there aren't staying exactly where I wanted to, so I'm, I'm working a little harder on that. Sorry, I'm getting technical. Uh, come on up. And he kind of invites all the rest of you up. Uh, well, on the way up, uh, this is like, oh, have you considered using uh, uh, anchors? Uh, or possibly put the, putting them on the uh, the the uh, the reef sections. Uh, he starts getting uh, uh, scientific back at him. Okay, uh, and for Annie and Medrick, you, you kind of lose the track a little bit unless you yourselves have some training in this direction. Yeah, they they, <laughs> they get quite quite. Uh, 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 technical after a moment or two uh, jonas has tried some of the things you've suggested but is very pleased to hear some of the other suggestions that he just quite didn't think about you get the impression that uh jonas while well somewhat learned and and having worked on the lighthouse itself ever since he married harriet uh actually even before then he was an apprentice which is how they met um he's never been on a boat <laughs> and so the perspective you bring from how the charts could be read and how to how to do floats like that is pretty valuable to him. Um, but he leads you up to a, the broad table at the other end of the room. Um, as you enter, um, you see that there's been some changes since you were last here. Um, it looks as though a lot more uh, glass and crystal have been incorporated into the central mechanism. Um, there's also now, uh, it's also a lot warmer in here. And you thought at first the, the heat was coming from the uh, fires downstairs where they were burning to, to heat and cook things. 
But in fact, uh, there's an additional couple of open flames up here. Um, it looks as though what he's doing is trying to uh, use multiple sources of light uh, to try to generate a single beam and then concentrate all of those. Um, it's not nearly as strong as the, uh, the central crystal or central uh, um, stone was itself, but uh, it does seem to be working somewhat more effectively, although it, he has to open the windows <laughs> because it's so warm in here. And there's a sort of constant smell of, uh, of, of smoke. And you can see that there's new uh, inserts added to the ceiling to let smoke out uh, that are kind of greasy and, and black around the outside with creosote. Uh, sorry about the mess. I'm still kind of adjusting things. It looks fancy and complicated. Uh, yeah, Silas looks around, and, and Silas is smart, but this part's starting to get beyond him. Uh, he's like, ah, well, at least it's nice and cozy up here. That too. Yeah, the heat feels great to you, Medric. Uh, it's it's almost familiar, and you kind of get the feeling that because the stone had been here so long, while the strength of it is is nowhere uh, to where it had been, um, the presence of Ignis, Ignis lingers. Um, it's almost as though it's like an after image more than anything else. Yeah. There's no sense of, of Ignis being here at the moment in the way that you would know from being near the Everflame. But there's that sort of that sort of burned in reflection, if you will. Cool. Um, Maybe you could turn this into a temple of Ignis. Well, I suppose. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, Jonas would enjoy the stone turning into fire. It would kind of do poorly in the light department. <laughs> Are you saying this out loud? Just yeah, I'm assuming uh, Silas is joking. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, Jonas leads you over to a table where he has one of the charts spread out in front of him. It looks as though this is a, a copy of a chart that someone on board a ship had made of the bay. Um, it's been yeah. annotated somewhat since then, um, mostly noting uh, where reefs uh, have been uh, spotted around the Dead Man's Fingers in particular. Um, a lot more additions were made. So whoever did this map uh, wasn't aware of the reefs themselves. Uh, but it looks as though work from either the Frey family or, or Jonas himself uh, to add to this um, to make it uh, look better. I've got a bunch of charts of the area uh, up and down the shore, but most of those are probably out of date by now. Not that the shore changes all that much, I suppose, but uh, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I guess Silas will basically look at and, uh, he'll take one, he'll try to plot out where we know the uh and look at the larger map again uh, uh, um Okay, so yeah, the lighthouse and Cape Raven are at opposite ends of the bay. Yep. Um, so Silas knows where it's stopping along the the road up to Cape uh, Raven, and he would have uh, he would have taken some mental notes of where it was stopping on our our trip out to here. Uh, and he'll try to fill in where he where he uh, thinks the extent of the storm uh, is. Um, and basically, if I remember correctly, Catherine told us that it the thing would be in the center of the storm. So he's going to try to take those points on the map where he knows that the edge of the storm is uh and basically using math that i do not know uh try to figure out where the center of the storm is i know there's math that does it but it is not the kind of math i am good at 
<laughs> okay. Well, uh, in that case, um, Jonas can assist you with this because he does know a thing or two about maps. Again, never having been on a ship means that interpreting them is a little bit harder for him. Uh, unless someone else would like to try to help, Annie or Medrick, uh, if you're trained in cartography. This is important. <laughs> well, I mean, I am, you yeah. could put some bad things on the map. You can add a few things to the map if you want to. Just slip in an extra island somewhere or like here be dragons or, you know, treasure here, totally dig. <laughs> and it's like in the water. <laughs> Um, what are Annie and Silas, Annie and Medrick doing? Because this is going to take a while. This is going to be one of those things where you kind of get, they start talking and they start rolling out maps and you see Silas with this strange sort of, uh, uh angled thing. Uh, it's like, it's like a, a big V shaped thing and he's kind of measuring things out and he's got a couple of other smaller angular things and there's a, and some uh, rulers, some rulers and other things. Uh, yeah, I, I just know they're talking about like angles and math, and it's like, yeah, I get that this sort of thing is important if you're driving a ship, but we always had people on the ships when I was going to war to do that for us, so I just kind of like never learned. See, so it's going to be like the adults in Charlie Brown. Like, what word about that? Because... <laughs> you really know about charts and stuff and how to do this. Annie has no clue. <laughs> so she's, she's probably just like keeping an eye out like on the horizon for any ships or what's going on on the water okay yeah i'm just gonna look around look at the stone not directly at least not yet okay there's not really much of the stone here remember it's it's it's, it's very very weak yeah um so and, that means i can look at it directly and again augmenting things if you'd like to there is there is a, a spot where you can kind of open up the uh, well not really open up but there are the the sort of spouts that are on the sides of this thing. I'm not gonna open it up because I don't want to touch anything <laughs> in case like things go boom. But... Okay. But yeah, I'll just try to look in. Okay. Knowing that it's not going to be nearly as powerful as the last time. All right. So um, what we're going to do is a bunch of roles here to determine the kind of outcomes that are happening. Um, for Medric, it'll be a religion role. Let me, let me know, or I will ask what you, the result is uh, later. So just know that you're making that role, and I'll fit it in the narrative here in a moment. Uh, Annie, you're going to be making a perception role. And Silas, you, you are trained in cartography or something similar, or ships? Navigation tools. Like there you go. That'll be perfect. And you'll have advantage Navigation on your role. Navigation and water vehicles. Well, if you were on a boat doing it, <laughs> mm -hmm. if the uh, if the tower is uh, is is floating in the water, then something's gone wrong. Medrick did actually 19. succeed in, in hitting something explosive. So uh, what, you're got a 19 on your on your roll. That's good. Uh, I got a 17. 17. Okay. And Annie. I got a natural perception. Natural. 20. So 21. Woot. Hey. All right, you guys are doing great. All right, um, let's begin with Medric. As you find yourself kind of studying this and all the augments that have that that uh, Jonas has put into place to use, uh, kind of like what he's doing before, where he was using burning flame as the substitute for the stone. Now he's got additional burning flames, essentially all uh, combining together their light using different crystals and, and, and uh, mirrors to kind of reflect everything. Um, you kind of uh, instinctively almost find yourself drawn towards the light and even putting your hand uh, for a moment in the, in the chamber where all the light is being gathered and you feel that sort of intense but familiar uh, heat um, from the light. And it's, it's not... It's not the direct feeling of Ignis you've had before. This is this is clearly just mundane light that he's gathering and, and augmenting the light of Ignis with. But at the same time, um, there is almost a, an additional flicker from the stone itself, um, almost as though it's responding to this this great influx of light. Uh, you're not sure exactly what that means, other than the presence of Ignis is being channeled somehow. 
Jonas has expressed some interest in the Flame Keeper and, and the, the Everflame before. Um, kind of curious, perhaps, about maybe the, the mechanism behind it. But in a mundane way, he's kind of created his own Everflame. This is gathering light that's he's generating from the flames to augment the, the central stone. And it's not a temple. But even as joking as uh, Silas was before, there might be something to this somehow getting dedicated to Ignis. You're not sure how to go about that or okay. what it would mean, but if the Everflame could be mounted here, then Jonas could take advantage of it. Cool. Annie, getting the perspective of the storm and the bay from from this lighthouse, uh, it it has a very strange feeling to it. You've been in the storm, you've seen the edge of the storm as you walk up closer to it, but this far out and up high, you start to get a shape of the storm. Um, and it definitely is taking on uh, a, a weirdly uh, almost dome shape. Um, at its apex, at its top over the town, though, it starts to merge with natural clouds. And you can see how um, the natural clouds, as they come closer and closer, it's almost as though they become corrupted uh, and, and become part of the storm itself. You also note that uh, the winds are starting to swirl and darken, so the fog that was there before uh, is starting to loosen a little bit, but the clouds overhead are thickening, almost as though the fog's energy itself is being drawn upward into a storm that looks almost like it's swirling now overhead. Uh, you also note a familiar ship coming in towards the uh, the bay. Uh, it has that familiar... Uh, uh, Backwards facing woman on the um, on the flag. You pull up one of the spy glasses that are here and take a closer look. Uh, and while it's too far away to make out full full details, you're pretty sure that that person standing, not so much on the prow, but practically on the lead beam of the ship, that's probably Gaetano. This is probably the errant widow, finally making its way back towards town, sailing straight for the storm. Um, which seems to be gathering. Silas, as you're working through all of these uh, these lines and graphs, something very strange is happening to the way you're you're working this out. Um, Jonas has made numerous observations, mostly about the beam itself, but he's also able to make certain angular notations about where the edge of the storm is. On the worst days, when the sleet is really, really heavy, when the rain is pouring right down, but fortunately there's no wind, it actually affords a pretty clear line that he, could, he was able to measure as to where certain aspects of the storm were. Given those two points, it gives you a pretty good idea of what the radius of this is. But patching, uh, patching it in with some of your own measurements, um, it starts to get a little confusing. And for a while, it's difficult to, to understand why these numbers aren't coming together. Each time you're drawing lines, it should be intersecting at the right point, which would be the center of it. They don't. They seem to intersect a little bit off. Uh, and then finally, you're looking at it going uh, and remembering some of the, the additional trigonometry lessons that came with your, your, uh, your uh, time on ship um, because of the way that certain whirlpools would interact. You had to be able to plot a, a course through the whirlpools in such a way where you're not going to be pulled in by other ones by either one, rather, but you could you could navigate them with, um, in, a, in a line between them. And that's when you realize there isn't one radius of the storm. There seems to be two. It's almost oval-shaped in the way that it's built. One of them would be in the bay itself. One of them would be in the middle of town. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and uh, Jonas has pulled an onion skin paper over top of the, his original chart, so you're not marking up his chart, but you're kind of taking yeah. the measurements, and, and uh, you have something you can take away, which, given the landmarks you've inc included on it, you'd actually be able to either map up with another chart or even use it as yourself and annotate it. Um, we've got... There's, there's two centers here. Uh, one in the bay, and I'll 
pointed out to Annie and Medrick. Uh, about where in the bay is it? Like middle of the bay? Uh, actually, just out beyond. Or, well, I mean, I, I don't give the numbers for you, but um, yeah, looking at the, the the way the chart goes, and with an estimation of how far out the docks go. This would be about where the bay uh, is deep enough for big ships to anchor themselves. Yeah, so uh, just where it's just where the the edge of land underneath starts to drop off and drop off severely. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the other point seems to be here in town. Uh, again, what what rough area in town is that? Um, if you, if you it's miracle, we're gonna go have words. I mean, you'd have to overlay an actual map of town or find some way of of, of correlating it once you got there, but it's roughly... So not like an exact thing. I mean, he's lived there all his life, so he knows the layout of the town. Yeah. But just judging from, oh, it's about this far in and it's in this quarter of town, like, just roughly where does he think it is? Um, I'm going to bring up the crude map here just so I can reference it myself. Um it's a little shy of center. Um, so there's the central road, which runs all the way down to the docks and joins up to the Royal Road at the other end. Um, and the public market is kind of a, a, a intersection of numerous roads on that one as well. And judging by it, it's not directly under the public market, but it wouldn't be too far from there. Uh, the public okay. market on one side having, uh, as other landmarks, it, the... The windmill is on one side of the public market, uh, as is that fancy restaurant that uh, Berendel took you to. Um, but it's not quite in that directly in that area. It wouldn't be under yeah, the, yeah. the main road, but somewhere to the, I guess, judging by this, somewhere northwest of that road, but of the central road, but not far. Um, um, now, does uh, does the town have an actual sewer system, or are the tunnels that Marigold was in something we didn't know about? Uh, there are tunnels that run underneath the town, mostly uh, for drainage purposes, because the water which yeah. comes in uh, does come in pretty far. Uh, but most of it's diverted under the tunnels underneath, and it has it has the other secondary use as a sewage. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, if you point that out and said uh it, it looks like it's near the the guard tower and the uh the public market area within a couple of hundred feet of there anyway yeah 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 somewhere in that region uh that means there i mean there could be someone in the town who's working with them or maybe it was hidden under in the the tunnels or something um that one might be the easiest one to deal with first uh if we can do something with that then maybe the storm will just pull into the bay instead of being on the town as well uh, and he kind of looks at annie with that uh, that sounds reasonable also i yeah. think get down ship is is on its way can they take the storm I mean, I, I don't know. And I like grab the telescope and like point point it out. Huh. Well, For I the storm I, device that's in the bay, we would we'd have to go underwater again. Yes. Damn I think it. we would we'd need a boat or a ship to take us out, and then we'd have to go down in. I can help us. I I can help you breathe underwater. Um, but yes, we probably, uh, the one that's in the middle of the bay, is that in the rough area that we went down the first time or is it a completely different part? That's a different part. That was a lot closer to the lighthouse itself and farther okay. out into the water. Um, so yeah, we might have to uh, find someone to take us out if we don't wanna try swimming the whole distance. Is, Probably would not be very comfortable. No, it, no, it wouldn't be. Is anybody watching the ship, or you decided to not? Uh, well, she pointed the the telescope out so that I could see it. So I'll take a little look at it, but uh, okay. 
Um, you see the yeah, like Lance outside too, but I'm assuming I can't compete with the few that Annie's got with the telescope, so I'll just wait for her comments. I mean, you can look out the window and you can kind of make out the ship barely on the horizon. It's far enough away that uh, uh, that it's really hard to pick out by sight alone. Um, and but you you kind of are able to do that thing where you know Annie says, "Oh, there's a thing right there," and you're like, "Yeah, I think you're right." <laughs> There's, looks like there could be a thing right there. Uh, with the uh, the telescope, though, Silas, uh, and kind of having some practice at uh, with using them as well, even rough directions are, are good enough for you to quickly find the ship. You see a flurry of activity on board, and you see that they're actually uh, bringing down most of their sails right now. Uh, and you can see uh, long oars being lifted into the water. Oh. I didn't know their ship was fitted for that, but they're putting out oars. Normally, a ship this size would not be doing oars because it's it's too uh, it's too uh, big a ship for that. But they are equipped for it. Yeah, it's going to be. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but it's. I mean, at least they'll handle the storm better. So uh, he'll he'll turn to Annie and try to say that reassuringly. That uh, I mean, it it seems like they know what they're doing. So. I mean, he didn't get where he where he is today, not knowing how to get out of tough situations. <laughs> and to a certain degree, I mean, you you would know Annie that the the reputation that uh, that Sir Uswin has, it, it it is probably bigger than the actuality, because some of the stories are pretty broad, and you know that he's told a few of those stories himself when gathered at the at the. Uh, uh, at the palace, but uh, if even half of those stories are true, um, he's got a decent chance at it. Uh, although, whether the song Sir Oswin the Unsinkable is actually true or not is debatable. Given the last time he came into the, the bay, he got swept <laughs> overboard uh, by the attack from the Sea Devils. Um, well, he only got sank once. It's like we're on rounding down 0. 0.0001 to 0, right? <laughs> Divide by zero <laughs> at that point. Um. Yeah. I like say a little like, "Good luck" under my breath. There, you've got this. <laughs> Sending good vibes. <laughs> so uh, the way this is going to happen is you are going to be acting as members of the crew, at least in terms of <sighs> roles. I'm not going to make you try to figure out how sailing works. Um, but this is going to be an extended task for them, four successes before three failures. Uh, and once again, I want you to, well, as with all of these tasks, I want them to be creative exercises. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blather on for a moment to give you some time to think. So the idea is that you will be taking, you can, you can call them three positions on the ship, if you will. Uh, and with whatever position you choose, you can, you can imagine that they have a plus five proficiency bonus and a plus three uh, stat bonus, so a total of plus eight to your rolls. Um, but with the position that you choose, and I kind of would like each of you to choose at least some position recognizable on the ship, if not a title position, um, I want you to come up with a creative explanation about how they are going to try to help make it through this storm safely. Uh, and the fourth role I'll make, which will be Uswin's role uh, as he leads things, so if you have a good creative idea, this would be a, a good opportunity to, to come up with that. Imagine yourself on that ship. You know the storm is there. You have some good leadership, so you're confident, but you've got to come up with something to do. And then when you're ready to do it, do it uh, with your explanation. Give me a great explanation. We'll see if about possibly getting advantage. And then you'll roll a plus eight roll. Difficulty, 15. So who would like to go first? Who has an idea for what could somebody on the board could be doing? There could be somebody at the bottom yelling at all the rowers, like with the oars, like trying to keep them, like rowing all together, basically. Okay. So keep the the, the uh, I don't remember the. Does anybody remember the the the, the positions? It's something like a, a rowmaster. Uh, the guy that says like row. I think, <laughs> I think it's the bosun, but I'm not absolutely certain. Okay. Well, we'll say no, it's. it's not the well, we can say it's the bosun uh, or the the gangmaster uh, or the uh, 
the gang leader because it would be the the rowing gang. The drill sergeant. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember the name of the guy on the rowing team who's up calling out the the, uh, the beat. Oh but yeah. There is a person, anyways. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I, I'm not going to try to look that up. At some point, I'll look up Salem. It. That sounds like it. Might be. It's 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 spelled like Coxswain, but I think it's is it Cosin or 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 is it actually that I don't know. All right. I know both of them. Okay. So uh so Medric, or rather I should say Nax, as the you. position of of, uh, of Coxswain, or what'd you say, Cosin? Uh yelling out orders. Uh, give me a, a demonstration without having to yell, but give me a demonstration of the motivation methods that this person has for getting them to to do their jobs properly and in order. It's like, all right, we only have like one chance at this. Otherwise, our ship sinks to the bottom of the ocean. We don't want that to happen again. So let's all row together. One, <laughs> two. And just keep count like that. So, I mean, I know you're not a motivational speaker. I can tell by just what you said. Uh <laughs> that uh, we only have one chance and we don't want it to happen again. Uh, not necessarily yeah. votes in confidence, but I like the effort and spirit. It was a, an unusual choice. So go ahead, make your roll with advantage, plus five, diff- or plus eight, difficulty 15. Woo, there you go. So the, the They like my dark sense of humor, so I guess they're rolling on my count. One, there you go. row, there you go. two, row, <laughs> So. Oh my God, we're gonna, all going to die if we don't do this right. <laughs> and if we do this right, we get ale at the three bells. All right. Why don't you go ahead and, and you can work on this while we're going around, but uh, give me a, a character sketch, not an actual sketch, but just a few lines about who this Coxwain is. Uh, give me, uh, you know, maybe a name, maybe a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a race, and uh, maybe one line about who they are. I think it'd be kind of fun to have you meet them later on. Okay. Who's next uh, in this challenge? Who would like to uh, to become one of the crew? Anybody? <laughs> I mean, I would say the captain would probably be making sure that it's Keeping the boat steady. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it continues to go straight. Um, this is one of the few people you've actually met before um, from the uh, Errant Widow. Uh, Captain Stoutheart, a uh, female dwarf who was the one who came into the, to, came in looking for Gaetano in the, uh, in the Three Bells once. Uh, so we know a little bit about, uh, about her. Um, so tell me about how she's doing this. She's probably yelling to make sure every everyone has everything hunkered down and like bracing herself to keep the uh, the rudder straight with the the wheel. Okay, I'm going to focus more on the rudder part than yet again yelling. Uh, I will say, well, yelling has been done. That that skill has been done. Uh, but yep. uh, at the wheel and keeping it steady and keeping it turning when it needs to be, that sounds like a great opportunity. Uh, and uh, the first mate boot would be right beside her. Let's have you make that roll as she tries to keep the ship going in the direction she means it to go. And with advantage. Okay. So 17 plus 8. All right. So that is 25. You guys are doing great. That's awesome. Uh, yes, and so she she literally lashes herself uh, to the deck and to the to the wheel to keep it straight. Uh, Stoutheart by name, Stoutheart by by uh, by life as well. And now we know a little bit about Captain Stoutheart already, but your task is to add one thing that would be unusual, something that people might not expect Stoutheart to have. Uh, it could be a, a habit. Uh, hopefully it's humorous. Hopefully it's positive, but it could also be negative if you want to go that way. I'll give you some time to think about that as we now turn to Pat about what... Opium. There we go. <laughs> um, okay. Up 
way up at the top of the ship in the crow's nest is one-eyed Mary, their Kenku scout, <laughs> who goes, Rock! left, Rock! more left, other left. Rock! Okay. Uh, I, I, I... Sorry? Probably port and starboard, but... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think probably port and starboard if they're any good at being a crow's nest or a crow in the crow's nest. Well, we'll see how the roll goes. All right. Well, I'll give you advantage because that's amusing. One-eyed Mary. Although I don't know about a one-eyed uh, uh, scout in the crow's nest. That seems like it's a, a bit of a disaster. You always use you uh-huh. <laughs> Spyglass, one eye. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. So make your roll plus eight with advantage. Against difficulty 15. Oh, that added two together. Well, I got a 17 and a 10. 17 is enough. Uh, as once again, calling out from up above, in whose voice? Because uh, Kenku don't speak with their own voice. I, it's hard to say. I, if uh, she has to borrow voices, then she's borrowing the captain. Okay. Uh, I know they have to borrow the things they say, but uh, yeah. All right. You hope they were trained well uh, and, and taught the right things to say as opposed to some of the parrots out there who swear constantly. All right. Well, that's the, the, the three, uh, three crew members contributing to this. You know, if I thought about the swearing, then yes, she would have swore blue streak every time she was saying port and starboard. <laughs> That's probably quite fair. Uh, and why do I imagine that the swearing is probably in uh, Gaetano's voice uh, as much as anything else? Uh, which might sailors, also, they all swear. They do. They, it actually would be funny to have a chorus of swearing coming from uh, the Kenku atop uh, as, they, as they kind of follow through with multiple of the crew members. So uh, I'll give you a moment uh, uh, to uh, think about, uh, let's see, in your case, uh, think about a phrase that the Kenku repeats all the time and who that phrase comes from and how the Kenku has misinterpreted that phrase. Uh, so they might use it as their catchphrase, but, uh, but haven't, uh, haven't fully interpreted it correctly. So I'll give you time to think about that as I'll describe Gitano. Um, let's see, what can Gitano do which would be interesting here? I think Gitano is going to lash himself to that forward spar and be calling out last-minute directions uh, to the entire crew. Uh, doing so uh, in between singing. He has a lovely singing voice he doesn't often get to use. It bellows like the winds themselves. Uh, and uh, is is one of those things that helps the the, the, the the coxswain because it keeps beat. It helps the captain because it gives direction as he as he pops in once in a while. It helps the kenku because it gives them more things that they can repeat that uh, can confuse everybody at the time. So that's going to be his his role, drawing upon the uh, the crew. This is going to be funny because I'm probably going to screw this up. Uh, well, not so bad so far. And a nat 20 for the second roll. So uh, this will be one of those incidents that goes down in the legend of Sir Uswin, the time he guided them through a storm with a song in his heart. Uh, so far, so good. It looks <laughs> like they're, you see them uh, through the, the spyglass as they all seem to set to. The oars go into the water. Uh, you can even hear kind of echoing weirdly across the waves the the reverberating sounds of singing as it gets picked up by many of the crew every once in a while intercepted by the shout of uh, starboard port uh, echoed by the the kenko up top and carried through by the captain uh, going across the water now we we'll return back to the coxswain uh, 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 nax what do we know about the coxswain what do you have for us how do you spell that word, by the way? <laughs> um, C-O-X-S-W-A-I-N, I believe. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing it at all correctly, but I know the word. Um, okay. I don't know. I don't know what it means. 
I don't know how to say it properly. I don't know what I know about this word, <laughs> to be honest, or how I even know it. <laughs> okay, so his name is Andrig, and he, he's a dwarf. I'd say probably 105 years old. So that's like fairly young by dwarf standards or Definitely. like middle age by... It would be like a 30-something-year-old human. Anyway, a child. A mere so he's child. Got... What? I'm a mere child at 30-something. <laughs> Says one of the yeah. older people here, that's all. Okay. <laughs> all right. So he's got uh, dark brown hair and beard, long hair, and a beard about six, seven inches long. There's a single braid holding back his hair, like the one, the hair that would usually fall in his face, like that's being held back in a braid. And there's, again, some braids in his beard, and they're, they're more like functional in nature. So like, A, to keep hair out of the face and to keep food from getting stuck in his beard. So it's like, while they are braided, there's like still some frizz, like sticking out a little bit because he doesn't really give a shit. <laughs> okay. He's wearing so a far. studded leather armor, has a sword by his side. I'm not sure what kind of sword. And he was a drill sergeant in the army, but he was generally like more well liked or at least less disliked than other drill sergeants because he used like dark humor to get people to do things. Okay. Very nice. Yay. And it was, you said Andreg? Yeah, A N D R I G. I G, okay. Uh, any idea what, uh, what clan name or what family name? I haven't thought that far yet. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. I, I was just curious, and, and uh, that was a great description. Thank you very much. So, Andrig no will now become a permanent member of the Errant Widow. Annie. Cool. You were uh, thinking about the captain and something that people may not know about the captain. What is that? I've had a hard time with this. Uh, <laughs> um. I think that they would have, when when they're steering, they always have their sword. They stab it in the floor beside them. So it's always there at a moment's notice for her to just take her hand off and grab it. Uh, and she'd also kind of been, be using that to help steady herself. All right. I'm writing this down. I like that a lot. Thank you very much. I think that's a really cool image. Like, there's a permanent groove where, like, a permanent hole that keeps getting patched up, but she keeps putting it there. <laughs> I wonder if some of the crew at a certain point don't, you know, paint a little target on it. Uh, or even <laughs> paint, like, different uh, different values. You know, it's like, oh, it's, it's a calm day. It only went in this far. Or it's a really, really rough <laughs> seas. That, that's a, a much bigger uh, <laughs> indentation. Right, right now it's sticking through the through the plank. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh, and Pat, what is something uh, for the Kenku? Uh, well, so average Kenku height, about five feet tall. Um, she showed up on the ship one day, screaming out of the crow's nest, and they haven't been able to get her to leave. <laughs> okay. Uh, she proves reasonably useful. Uh, and you're looking for a quote. Uh, be the captain saying, seize, damn it, Mary, get off that. Uh, meaning, uh, in her mind, good job, Mary. You can go on to the next thing. All right. I like it. Hasn't left the crow's nest since as well. Very cool. Thank you for, for helping me <laughs> fill out the errant widow. Uh, and as you watch with the, the combination of these things and the snatch of song on the breeze as the errant widow uh, turns first uh, to the side and looks almost as though it's turning away from uh, the storm entirely, turning away from the bay, but then sort of does this zigzagging pattern, uh, digging into or diving in towards the, the, the shore and then back out again, slowly making its way. You can see that the waves now are starting to churn up one of the other things you observe in this is that while the storm has its own ebb and flow at unpredictable moments, now it seems to be gathering energy. The wind seemed to be blowing uh, faster. You can see a bird or two that was flying through the area, leaning as it should into a wind, and then the wind seems to have changed dramatically as the bird is whipped off in a different direction. 
as the 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 uh, the storm itself seems to react like a living thing, um, and uh, the waves start to churn up. The seas themselves are fairly calm. Uh, the regular waves that come in off of the sea are are expected, but as soon as they sort of reach and crest over the edge of the storm, they start to steepen up quite considerably, throwing the boat up. Medrick, for a moment, as as you kind of see off in the distance, you have that sense of of familiarity almost in watching the ship, uh, but you can just barely see kind of tilt sideways, reminding you somewhat of your dream the other night. Yeah. Um, and I'm as, wondering, like, is he going to drift that ship into the bay? Like, <laughs> I mean, if there was anybody going to do a drift and look cool while doing it, it would probably be Gaetano, but yeah. <laughs> uh, at this particular moment, um, you see that the, the front of the ship actually does dip into the water, and Gaetano himself, tied to the spar as he is, goes underwater with it. As the ship comes back up, though, um, uh, with the, the eyeglass, you can see that he's still there and still seems to be singing, doesn't even seem to have missed a note in his in his travels. Um, the oars now are beating frantically only on one side of the ship, trying to right it and keep it steady. The captain has twisted the, the uh, wheel over uh, to the other side, making another sharp turn into the wind. From up above, you can see the flapping of wings as the, uh, as the Kenku, uh, uh, oh man, a spotter, what's the term? Um, oh, look out. No. Uh, yeah. Look Something out, like that, yeah. Uh, as they as they are are are, are holding on, but also uh, relaying the orders interpreted from the from Gaetano in front, and finally somehow uh, you see them come to a halt, and through the spyglass you can see the launching of not one, not two, but four anchors off of one side, presumably matched by four anchors off the other side as well. Uh, they drift into the water, and you can see the ship. Uh, start to to hold fast, even though waves are continuing to beat on it. It shifts and, and, and moves slightly in the area, but holds fast where it is in the in the uh, in the ocean. Uh, it does actually. Sorry, it can actually go all the way in, uh, but it actually would be very close to the docks at this particular point. Probably closer than most of them would set anchors, but it did. Uh, probably intending to be able to uh, to load up from the dock itself. <laughs> Amy would be narrating everything she can see. I kind of imagine these sort of Howard Cosell sports type, uh, and and then they do this, and it is dramatic. Oh, geez, he's fine. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, after uh, the storm continues to rage for another five or ten minutes after the ship has seeming to launched its numerous uh, anchors, uh, Silas, that is definitely not something you've seen on another ship. Um, that is either an innovation, an over-engineering, or just something weird about this particular ship. Uh, but they have anchored themselves, and a few minutes later, the storm continues, but not as strongly. And the waves on, on the sides of the ship seem to have abated, almost as though, uh, of all the ships that have challenged the storm, this is the one that caused it to go, screw it, I'm done. <laughs> And just stop bothering to try to 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 take the the errant widow down. Uh, good job, everybody! You guys brought the ship in safely. Woo! I was prepared to have the errant widow crash upon the shore and be destroyed into a million different bits, but you guys came up with some good solutions and some great roles. So, thankfully, I didn't have to destroy my. Oh, how prepared my... were you if you gave us plus eights? <laughs> I mean, they're a competent crew. That was also a part of the indication there. But you know, <laughs> um. Bad rolls can happen. Yeah. But after that exciting moment, you have the parchment which indicates roughly where those two zones are. Jonas is looking at you, Medrick, and kind of noticing that you've been a little bit closer to his creation than he would expect. Uh, you gather that probably uh, from a lot of the experiments he's been doing, that's why he does have a burn here and there on his clothing or that scorch mark across this this heavy leather uh, apron that he wears or the thick leather gloves he has off to one side uh, whereas you're basically going huh and, and practically poking huh. the flame uh, with your bare hand <laughs> um, one thing you do actually notice as you're standing there and having stood there for this entire time for the most part um, is the 
a little bit of a glow from the shield. The shield. The shield, like the uh, thing holding the stone. No, no, your shield. Okay. Uh, which is now at its smallest size. Um, you had known that to be fully effective, this shield needs to see the sun. And while you've made trips outside of the storm each day, um, here in the presence of this light, it seems to be almost uh, even more invigorated. It's not quite the same degree as, as the invigoration that you felt when you uh, uh, stood in the beam itself. But you get the feeling that it, it's, it's absorbing some of that latent presence of Ignis. Cool. Hey, Jonas. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have this shield last time, but uh, the Flame Keeper gave it to me, or loaned it to me, but now that she's gone, I suppose it's given. Yoink. Anyway, uh, it glows brighter when it's next to the stone. Huh. I wonder what it's made of. I, Or maybe it's something inherent in the connection to fire? Oh, man, I... Yeah. I really wish I'd had a chance to meet the Flame Keeper properly. I did get a chance to talk with her once, but I didn't realize I was going to have so little time. No, neither did I. I'd love Fucking to learn, Sea Devils. I'd love to learn more about, about Ignis and the connection to Flame. Maybe there's something It seems there. like there's kind of an afterimage in this room. I guess I could feel his presence in the stone before, but... Although I guess now the shield can feel its presence too. If greatly diminished. It's pretty remarkable. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can It's talk almost sometime. like a... Well, we have the Everflame. It's the ever-burning flame that represents Ignis. And it's almost like you've built your own Everflame with this stone up here. Well, I'm doing what I can. I gotta keep the light as bright as possible. Yes, we do. Maybe we can talk about Ignis sometime. I'm curious. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Maybe there's some some lessons about about fire management that I can learn from from you and from the the lore. Yeah, I'd certainly be open to discussing this at some point. And uh, I'm hoping the temple will be rebuilt. So that means there would be another flame keeper at some point. That's great. Um, if, if they do, I guess I should say when, um, you light the, uh, did you call it ever flame? Yep. When you light that again, I'd love to be there. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Did you get what you needed, Silas? I think it works out, but it's beyond me. That 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 seems weird. No, I think it's. I think this is it. There are two of them. I think we should handle the one in the town first because I think, I think that will help the town the most. But we may have to go under the bay for the ne for the second one. We'll have to figure something out for that. I can ask um, Angus about if you want to borrow the the breathing pearls again. Uh, yeah. I know that he's got that one would... of them with him right now, just in case he falls off the boat. Good plan. Uh, yeah, just in case we find more captives down there. But uh, but that can probably wait until after we we search the town. Uh, thank you very much for your assistance. Uh, it's it's my pleasure. Not a lot of people come out to visit, and not a lot of people have any idea what I'm talking about. My wife tries, and she knows about how the lighthouse is supposed to work. It's part of the stuff that her father taught her. But I guess I've kind of gone off in my own direction a little bit. And her father tolerates it, although he, he's a little grumpy sometimes about some of the changes I'm making. 
But he knows the light's stronger when I do, do this, so I guess it works out. Um, I teach him the nerd team handshake. <laughs> <laughs> For bonus points, what is the nerd team handshake? God. <laughs> I don't do handshakes. Um, In a pandemic, I think the nerd team handshake is exactly two meters apart. Mm -hmm. It's like... <laughs> I think that's wax on windows, isn't it? That's wax on. Yes, that wax thing? on, wax off. <laughs> There's got to be some probably sort of something. That look, it doesn't look like anything to anyone else, but they're actually tracing out a like a small formula in the air, and then do, high five. I wonder if you could do like like something like that and call it pi r squared. If you can. Yeah. Uh, um. What's more like hashtag thumbs? <laughs> I mean, that could also be the geek, uh, the geek salute. The hashtag thumbs works for me. Hashtag thumbs uh, up. Um, but we should probably be going. Um, maybe you could stay for supper. I know that Henry would like to have you guys around for a little while longer and Astor's been asking after you, Annie, when you might be coming back again. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, what time is it about? Uh, at this point, because you took the horses out, um, it's probably about mid-afternoon. So, like, staying for, like, another half hour and then heading out should be fine? I mean, oh, definitely. Uh, we can stay for a little bit, but we really need to be getting back to town. I I'm okay with supper. You've got a lot of work to do. Gotta stop this storm. Things are getting bad in town. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I, I won't keep you for any longer than, than a few minutes, but... I know it would mean the world to have some different people here. Um, Esther's made a few of the trips into town. Um, she's growing up so quickly. I don't really understand. Uh, I'm not so sure that I'm entirely comfortable with that either. But her grandfather's gone with her, so I don't think she can get in too much trouble with him around. Henry's been asking about it, too. I think I've got a trip coming in. Um, I've got a couple of things that I might want to run through the the blacksmith, so maybe an Henry and I can make a trip in for that. Sure. Well, we're staying in the Three Bells if you want to stop by and see us. Assuming we're there. Oh, I'll... You might want to wait until after the storm is is done. It's it's pretty dangerous going in there right now. Is it really that bad? Angus didn't say anything about it being that bad, and Esther wouldn't say anything at all. There was a card accident outside my, my bedroom window today. A card accident? Okay, that does sound kind of bad. Just people in a hurry, not looking where they're going. And it's hard to see very far with the fog. Uh, it might just be safe to leave it for... Wait a few days and see if we can clear up the town some. All right. Well, at least you're here now. And uh, if it's only a couple of days, I'm, I'm sure we can wait. But come on, let's see the family. And he leads you back downstairs. Oh, go downstairs. Uh, Angus still isn't back, uh, but he wasn't expected to come back until the evening. He was literally going to be fishing. He literally was gone fishing all day long. Um, but that's... One of the you, you kind of imagine that one of the few luxuries for someone who's had a hard life out here working at this this isolated location uh, is having a family, and then one of the other luxuries is being old enough to get the hell away from that family for as long as you need to, because they can nice. take care of whatever being whatever happening. Um, but uh, uh, Harriet has been basically cooking a stew all day. Um, and uh, serves up a, a very quick meal for everyone. Uh, not quite as as uh, as fresh uh, 
uh, a meal as you might find at the Three Bells, but it's it's hearty and um, filling. And Henry is done through his bowl in about ten seconds, and then asking all kind of questions about the town and literally everything. Um, I just realized that I'm yeah, playing. Eats faster than I do. I, I'm playing a character in another game called Edry, and I've just realized that I modeled Edry and Henry off the same the same model. So uh, Henry is the much younger version. Um, <laughs> And Esther kind of pulls Annie aside as the, the conversation's going on uh, a little bit and just kind of has all kinds of general questions. Um, you get the impression, Annie, that um, while Angus is back was turned on the last trip into town, there was this boy that she was kind of talking to and she has all kinds of, of sort of questions along those lines where she's sort of wondering what to do and how to approach him and is it something real and how would she know if it's something <laughs> real and that sort of stuff. Um, Annie wouldn't have much experience with this type of stuff because, like, everybody she meets is very controlled. Um, so she would probably say to, like, not go behind her parents' back. Uh, that is not a good way to start things. Um, She's literally whispering to you in the corner, and, and her parents are on the other side of the room, <laughs> presumably not hearing. <laughs> yep. Um, but to talking is a good way to start. I don't know. She has no idea of your level of experience, other than the fact that you're not her mom. <laughs> yep. That that <laughs> like. I'm a 19-year-old. I that's been like lived the most sheltered existence ever. <laughs> you say so, and then you realize that Esther might have had a slightly more sheltered experience, even, uh, and maybe even a little, Fair. a little bit of sympathy in in some ways. Uh, or our understanding that, that her her role, her life here, in some ways, is not entirely unlike yours. Just taking away all the finery and the, you know, the the people coming through all the time. Yep. Yeah. So, her, her her advice will very much be the like, uh, play safe <laughs> advice of like, don't do anything stupid. Wear a bonnet. <laughs> Obey your bodyguards. Um, Kirk. Oh wait, you don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> Seek out the royal physician when necessary. Um, Silas, Henry reminds you a little bit of Nikki, but uh, kind of on Nikki's fastest moments, he's probably slower than Henry's slowest. The kid has a ton of energy and just wants to talk about everything. Uh, he shows you this uh, this neat little wooden duck that his uh, that Angus apparently made for him, carved out of uh, out of some driftwood, uh, and then kind of shows you this. Uh, this uh, 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 um, shark that Angus carved out of driftwood and uh, this bird that Angus carved out of driftwood. Um, I'm beginning to any, see a theme here. None of them have any painting to them, but they're, they're, they show some modest skill. Um, Silas uh, will have the... He'll have an illusion cover the area that makes it look like the wooden uh, carvings all come to life. Uh, and he technically can't cover up the originals all that much, so the originals will still be sitting there, but the other ones will be will be flying around, swimming through the air and whatnot. Um, Harriet is somewhat alarmed at first, but uh, uh, I'm assuming you say something comforting. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, look, Emery, your animals have come, your wooden animals have come to life. <laughs> uh, you, you, you kind of, in an instant, realize you, you know where Henry gets it, as Jonas is also pretty fascinated by the whole process <laughs> and asking all kinds of questions about how it's done, most of which you can't really answer because things are so instinctual to you on the level of, on the level of magic. Yeah, I, well, he does have 
he does have knowledge of Arcana, so he will try to explain a little bit. But he says it, it it's not it's not really like math. It's it's more like singing. Uh, it just kind of happens. He kind of he, he, he surprises you a little bit by proposing some rather esoteric theories about um, the the similarity between, uh, for example, the uh, the essence of light and heat, and and kind of the impression that neither one is a solid thing yet both actually exist, and kind of starting to 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 analyze magic in terms that he seems to understand, uh, and you get the impression too that that he actually studied a bit. Um, of Arcana, which is how he kind of came to be able to design the uh, the container that's currently holding the the bit of sunstone, um, but he doesn't yeah. quite have the same grasp of it intuitively that you've been able to do from your gift from the mother. Wait, what? How, how can something be both light and a wave, at, or both like a wave and a particle at the same time? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I've been thinking of a new term for it. It's called quanta. And thus, quantum what? quantum physics was invented in Omisha. <laughs> <laughs> I call it a wavicle. I mean, if, if there ever was something appropriate to describe magic, in particular, probably warlock magic, it would be spooky action at a distance. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all it's all quanta from here on. Um, but the 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 meal passes, the time talking passes, probably a little longer than you really intended to, but there was so much attention being being paid to you from this different group of people. Harriet uh, kind of, for the most part, standing back and just enjoying not having to keep Henry uh, occupied and not having to cheer up uh, Esther and uh, her husband uh, being there in front of her as opposed to hidden away in his his workshop upstairs. Um, but the time the time passes. The warm uh, stew still in your in your stomachs. Uh, the tide is is halfway out, so you get a little bit uh, soggy boots as you head out. Um, Esther tries to use that as an excuse of why you should stay longer until the the tide is actually fully out, but um, that's not going to be for a few hours. And you had expressed some interest in getting going as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah we really need to get back to, to town. I understand, says Esther. But maybe I'll see you in town? I, I don't know when I'm going to go again, but maybe I'll have an, some more news. And she kind of smiles, hopefully. Possibly. <laughs> and you make your, your exit... Um, yep. Head back to your your uh, your rather bored horses, and once again make your way back into town. Now we're, the session's going to come to a close fairly soon. Mm -hmm. We're after five, after all, which has been Ooh, our, our our typical closing off point. But um, on the way back, I wasn't yawning because I was bored. I just didn't sleep very much. <laughs> We're all in the same boat, I think. Um, as you come back into town, is there a, a discussion you'd like to have? Or a thought you'd like to share? Or plans you'd like to make? Just uh, regular chit-chat and asking, Hey, Annie, yeah. do, you, do you think you'll be back in town in, in time for your date with Verandel? <laughs> giggle to myself a little bit. <laughs> She, she just rolls her eyes and keeps going. <laughs> she gets a pair of natural 20s. She rolled her eyes. Ha. But it's... I should make you roll. Wait, is that what they mean by 2020 vision? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you uh, ride. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. As you ride back into town. Kind of chatting about how awesome that was, the, the watching the boat, like that was like kind of amazing. Yeah. And you can't help but see, but have your eyes drawn out towards the, the, uh, the, the end of the docks as you're riding back into town. 
The fog is lifted now. It's just settling into a steady, heavy rain. The same sort of rain, Silas, that uh, that uh, Jonas would have used to to measure. It's that same sort of straight up and down, no wind, just heavy, uh, as you've experienced in town, almost impressive, almost intentionally depressing kind of uh, kind of rain. And as you look towards that boat, now securely moored into the 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 docks, uh, you see that indeed they are starting to load cargo on the ship, um, and you get the impression that they are planning to leave as quickly as they can. Uh, but uh, they had come in full and had left empty uh, because they were it was too dangerous for them to stay in docks and finish up their load. But since the caravans have come in since then, at least some travel through this town has been maintained how much longer they're going to be here you're not sure but at least they made it into the dock that's where i'm going to call it for this evening i know not your conventional sort of uh, conflict this evening but i hope you had some fun with the uh, the the ship uh, ship maneuvers nope. as we all demonstrate that we know nothing about the actual names of positions on ships which is kind of <laughs> kind of hilarious but fun all at the same time we all know the fantasy yeah. versions we all know the movie versions. Nobody gets the names right, well, except the ones that do. But I guess I'll watch Master and Commander or something and see if I know what's going on for next episode. I want to thank uh, I want to thank my machine for being so nice to me and not doing a damn thing wrong. I'm a little <laughs> bit, I'm a little bit uh, confused, concerned, and also overjoyed that uh, that was not my conflict this, this evening. I want to thank my players for joining me this evening. Uh, and uh, 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 putting up with my shenanigans uh, and the different uh, hopes. Uh, but I have a feeling that your conflicts will be very different in the next episode. Uh, so thanks very much to my players. Once again, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget that we stream this whenever all the stars align, which hopefully is 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoons in Atlantic time um, for a couple of hours. And if the uh, your... Uh, stars don't align with ours, you can watch it on YouTube later, youtube.com slash ENCAF1 or twitch.tv slash ENCAF1 for the live stream. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash LOTDI for Watchers of the Drowned Isles, where uh, we will occasionally drop in and say, hey, we aren't necessarily all great conversationalists, but at least we can say, hey. <laughs> uh, thanks again to my players. And we should be back uh, next week. Uh, we will probably be taking a, a little time off around the holidays for at least one weekend. But I think that most of us are keen to keep playing. Uh, and as I've hinted at before, we're also thinking, what are, could we do like a marathon day? And I'm going like, I haven't run a marathon in a while, but I can try. So we'll see how that works out over the holidays. You're muted, Annie. You're muted. You're muted. Your your sound muted microphone. <laughs> oh, I mean, we did do those like a couple of years ago, two days of twelve hour sessions. Yeah, that was spectacular. Yeah. yeah, I think that was pre streaming days back in the time, but you know, because oh, it was when uh, Adam was in town. Oh right, a couple of years right. Yeah, yeah we had. It, it was when Brody broke his leg while we were live. Right. Yes, I remember a <laughs> concerned text or something. Well, let's not hope that we repeat that part of the tradition. Uh, let us let us try to maintain a much more safe uh, production as well. But thanks again, guys, for playing. See ya. Thanks for running. <laughs> <laughs>